Okay. CBS trip was successful. Skittles have been consumed. So 45 minutes pre-lift. Honestly, I probably will. Uh, yeah, that's enough time, you know. It's not like you're going to eat some sweets or whatever and you're just instantly going to get a massive jump in energy. But I am inclined to believe that I will certainly have a little bit more... I don't want to say energy twice, but whatever. You know, energy in the lift after having those relatively fast digesting carbs. You know, it's still like sucra, not sucralose. I don't remember the name of like table sugar, but you know, there's varieties of complexities of carbs. Obviously, getting real complex, we're talking wheat breads, we're talking yams, uh, things along those natures. And then it gradually gets more and more simple, like from fruits, vegetables, stuff like that. And then real simple, actually, well, the simplest, you know, dextrose on that really far end. So maybe that would have been good pre-workout. But honestly, eh, I think kind of a slower releasing, because you got to think about this. What will happen is, let's say 50 grams of wheat bread, or, well, 50 grams of carbs worth of wheat bread, you know, your blood sugar will have a slight bump. Maybe not a slight bump, but it'll just have like kind of a round bump. It'll gradually increase, gradually increase, and then gradually decrease. You know, that's why people say to, you know, eat a big bowl of oatmeal for breakfast, because it's a, it's a filling food. You're going to kind of be full for a while. You know, that's why when I diet down, I try to eat more complex carbs rather than just sweets. And then on the crazier end, eating like sugars and real simple carbs more of a quick spike like that so in a dieting context I don't want to be I don't want to have big spikes in my blood sugar all day because what will happen is when it crashes that'll make you extra hungry so if you're trying to stay under a certain limit it's gonna be in your best interest not to you know eat a ton of sweets all at once because then you're gonna kind of have a rebound effect where you'll be even hungrier after eating them whereas if you had something a little slower digesting full of uh, uh, you know, and more filling, then you'd probably be less hungry for longer if you catch my drift. So, enough enough discussing that. It uh, yeah, it's actually like a forty five yeah forty five minute drive. So I haven't even drank the pre yet. I did a, I did two scoops of the watermelon candy bloodshot, and then the bubblegum grape hostility. On their own, both are good and combined. It's still good. It's like because they're both sweet, obviously. It's just kind of an interesting flavor combination. Though I mean, I really couldn't care. Well, obviously I do care. I like having a, I like when it tastes good. But really, I want that effect that it's going to give me. You know, if all pre-workout in the whole world just had a weird, like, re, like just bitter, weird, like, like black coffee. Like if it was like that. I mean, screw it, man. I'd still do it. Want to get that crazy pump? So, I'll probably drink that about maybe maybe 20 minutes out. I'll just slam it. Or maybe I'll start sipping on it 30 minutes out. I'm not sure. But I want it to have time to kind of kick in. If you just slam it right before you start your first couple of sets, you're not getting any benefits from it for those sets. You won't even be really feeling the caffeine for another 30 minutes. Or at least it'll, like the blood sugar, kind of be, it'll be a slow rise up to the peak, uh, you know, peak levels. But... Stop talking about the unreal, well, semi related topics. Let's just talk directly about what's about to go down. So, hamstrings, I don't really know what I'm going to do there because I've never been, well, I've never gone to this gym for legs before. I've only gone for chest. I've only ever gone here for chest and back, I've never done anything else. I mean, arms wouldn't really be any different than anywhere else. There's no mad specialty machines for arms. Apart from a couple tricep machines, which I'm always on the lookout for. But legs, I definitely get a little bit interested. Because they do have some, what look like some pretty cool machines, so I'm pretty excited to try that kind of stuff out. You, know, you always want to try new things, see how it feels. Even if I, I mean, you know, let's say I jump onto this 
leg extension that I've never tried before, do a couple sets and say, or do a couple like feeler reps and say, oh, I don't like that at all. Hey, that's it's a learning experience. On the other end, if I love it, I'm like, oh yeah, this is sick. This is badass. Same thing, you know. But hamstrings, I mean, I think I already kind of premised this before, or prefaced it. Tons of curls, laying, seated. Maybe standing single leg if they have one of those machines, that that could be pretty good. But I'm only doing eight sets for hamstrings and eight for quads. So there's no need for... Well, honestly, there's, there's pretty much no real need for me to do any more than four movements for a muscle group with that many sets. Just because, you know, I could do two sets of laying curls, two of seated, two of standing, maybe two RDLs of some kind. That's eight sets, then I'm done. Now those sets aren't like warm-up sets for the first two and then working sets for the first or for the middle four and then like back off sets for the last two. Now, my whole premise with these lifts, for the most part, is initial warm-up phase. You know, maybe sit on the machine I'm gonna use for my first set, do a couple reps with half the stack or you know, a low weight, get warm, get warm, get warm, don't actually do any damage, don't fatigue myself. And then that first set should be my heaviest and strongest. Well, I don't even want to say that because sometimes I do a lightweight, you know, light-ish, and I do a real squeezing set like I did yesterday for arms as the first movement. So I guess really want to, what I want to say is since I'm freshest for that first set, that's when I want to potentially go as heavy as possible, but definitely make sure I go as hard as possible. I guess that's kind of a big point. You should do that for every set. But after eight actual sets, once you're warmed up, you know, no warm-up sets. Well, what I'm really trying to say is the warm-up sets don't count. You're not doing any work. You're just getting warmed up for your actual sets, right? It's like, you know, you don't get any points for doing something good in practice. I mean, you get points for that performance. That might, uh, I don't think that's the right analogy. But you know what I'm saying. The warm-up purely serves its purpose to warm you up, to expose you to weight, to you know make sure you're going to be able to handle your working set without hurting yourself. I can't emphasize that part enough. Like, don't just jump straight into your max. Like, warm up to it. But do it as quickly as possible. Because there's no need to waste your time unnecessarily. Right. So Let's fast forward. Um, well... Fast forward about probably, it's three o'clock now. I'd say probably maybe two hours, two and a half hours from now, we'll be hitting the pump check. Because I gotta get there. Probably talk for a little bit. Put all my stuff down. Do my warm ups. For hamstrings at least. And then hams will be done. A little bit of warm up for quads. And then do quads. And then we can check the pump. So I'm pretty excited to get in there. They've got this big pendulum squat which I'm very interested in. I, uh, I've used one before pretty frequently at my, uh, at one of the gyms that I go to a lot, but this one looks a lot more, um, let's just say robust. I guess there's no point in teasing it. We'll just see it in the future. So let's, uh, I guess I'll see you in there. All right, we are freaking done. I tell you what. That was a solid leg day. I ended up just sitting on that adductor machine. Um, they weren't really like, let's just say, quote unquote, hypertrophy sets. You know, I didn't hype myself up and do a, you know, failure, AMRAP, whatever, this, that, and the other. Uh, it was really just kind of for some adductor activation. Because I definitely need my adductors to kind of toughen up. Because when I do heavy, heavy pressing with legs, they kind of flare up. And it's just because I'm lazy and I haven't been doing my adductors. They are an incredible stabilizer. I tell you what. So, squats will come back. Do not even think that squats are not going to come back. But for now on the cut, usually I do take a break from squats anyway. Just because they're a really freaking hard movement. And I don't mean that as in like... Oh, squats are hard. I don't want to do them. It's like, it's the same logic why I don't do deadlifts. Just because I'm taxing my whole system 
pretty freaking hard. You know, I gotta, I gotta sit here and plug in my directions, but like doing deadlifts, sure, you're gonna get some lat activation. You're gonna get some lower back activation, trap activation, but you're also spending a ton of energy activating your glutes, your hamstrings. And I mean, honestly, I don't really even want a big lower back. I want my lats to be fucking huge. I was just talking to somebody about this in terms of your, like that Christmas tree look that people talk about. Really, it's not from having a massive lower back. It's from having really developed lower lats, right? Like if this is your lower back, up here is your lats, right? Having them really developed, that's what gives you that Christmas tree look. That's how I see it, at least. So, here we go, 38 minutes. 38 minutes until my next meal, that's how I see that. I am freaking starving. So I didn't end up cooking that extra steak. I just, uh, like, it's, well, I guess I did cook it. Like, it's it was in the sous vide, right? So it's it's cooked through. But I didn't have t I didn't want to, like, throw it on the pan yet because I wasn't going to eat it. So I just threw it straight into the fridge. So I think I'll get home, throw some avocado oil onto the, uh, onto the skillet, sear it up, and that'll be a solid 80 grams of protein. Wait, actually, actually no, it's only, it's a little more than half a pound. And for the most part, that's going to end up meaning that, uh, well, typically a half pound of red meat. It's about 50 grams of protein-ish. Obviously, I'm going to calculate it, but, you know, just by guessing, it's going to be around 70 grams of protein and probably 15 grams of fat. Not that it's really fatty cut because it's a top round, but, you know, when I cook it in the avocado oil, a lot of that oil kind of gets sucked into it. You know what I'm saying? So, a little tip if you're going to be making steaks like that with high heat, you got to use an oil with a high smoke point. For any of you culinary, for any of you with a culinary interest, if you're just doing ground beef and you're you know, cooking it well done, then don't even sweat it. <laughs> you know, so. solid leg day, but that whole lift was mainly slow, controlled squeezing movements. I guess at the end of quads, it was a little bit more. Um, I don't want to say barbaric but a little more on kind of the rough side, like I was just pumping out reps, burning out. But for the most part, that was kind of a slow controlled day, which in a dieting phase, perfect. But maybe it's just like the kind of ego lifter inside my brain. You know, I like doing, I miss doing those heavy sets of squats where, you know, like it's in, it, it only happened once, but like a squat set that gives you a nosebleed, that kind of thing. That's, that's what I really kind of like, that style of training. But no matter what kind of sets you do, I mean, I, I say this a bazillion times, just go hard on them. So I'll definitely be feeling quads tomorrow. Hamstrings, I'm not so sure. Hamstrings, I'm not so sure if I'm going to be sore. It's not like soreness is really like a one-to-one -one indicator that you had an awesome lift. You know, I get a... Oh my goodness. I remember, I think it was either last summer or two summers ago, for cardio I tried to go on a jog, and my leg, my quads were like thrashed. I didn't even jog a mile, it was like, I don't even remember. I don't remember how long it was. It was not legit. Not even legit at all. But whatever, I tried to run for a period of time, like more than a, more than a minute. It was a little while. But really it just kind of turned into a long walk after like, I don't know, I want to say five minutes. But something about that, like the impact, the fact that I never do that, my quads were insanely sore the next day. But they didn't grow. <laughs> you can get sore, but have done something that won't stimulate growth at all. You know? So in that sense, that's, uh, well, I don't even know what I was about to say. That's just kind of, soreness doesn't mean you had a good lift. And not being sore doesn't mean you had a bad lift. It's just kind of whatever. Just kind of whatever. You know, sometimes you're extra sore, sometimes you're not. You can probably you know, give yourself a little bit more chances of not being extra sore, getting some good rest, eating your protein, taking all your vitamins, maintaining a solid level of hydration. Honestly, that's just quality of life things. So you don't get fucking headaches. You know? 
I never see anyone who has, you know, well, let's just say I've never seen anyone who, like, reasonably, consistently complains that they have headaches. I've never seen them carry a gallon jug around with electrolytes in it. So I'm, I'm pretty certain there's a strong correlation there. But, uh, you know, if you don't believe me, whatever. You know, do your workout with an exertion headache. Not going to bother me. I know I'm going to stay hydrated. So, enough of that little roast. Plan for tomorrow is chest. I, I, don't, I don't know where I want to go. I might come back here, or I, I might just go to my school's rec center. Or maybe I'll go to that other gym in between here and there. Because this world's was super cool. They've got a ton of equipment. But it's also a little bit far for me. But I do like changing it up. I'm going to have a lot of... A lot of factors at play here. A lot of moving parts. But it definitely will help your schedule. Well, maybe not your schedule. Let's just say your quality of life, in a sense, by having a couple different gyms at your disposal. Because let's say, you know, you go to one gym and you're like, oh, this gym's cool, but they don't have blank. Oh, I like this gym a lot, but it's kind of far. You know, stuff like that. Oh, I like this gym a ton, but the hours are kind of rough. You know, the, uh... But then again, it's then you're paying for multiple memberships, which is a little rough. So to balance that kind of stuff out. But in terms of macros, let's see what we're working with. I I was good today. It's 6 o'clock and I'm only at 1,400 calories. So I've got 1,100 left for tonight. Perfect. 100 grams of protein left. Maybe I'll only eat half of the steak. Because if I eat the whole thing, that's most of my protein. And protein is reasonably filling It'll, it'll kind of give you a feeling of being full. But not always. Like I was saying before, if you drink a protein shake, you're not really going to feel that full. So if you're cutting down and you're getting a lot of protein from shakes, I think you're going about it the wrong way, man. You should be eating some turkey, some meats, some, uh, some oh, I got some, I got some cod. Oh, I hope it's not bad. I got it a couple days ago. I wanted to try putting the fish into the, uh, into that sous vide. I'm fucking sous vide and everything, man. I'm an addict. I, um, that's a classic YouTube channel I always check out. I think it's called Guga Foods. Guga, I, I don't know. They make a ton of sous vide videos, so that's, that's where I learned it from. I'll, uh, yeah. Well, I think that's all I got, man. I got a, I'm drenched. Oh, no wonder I'm, I feel so sweaty. I don't have the AC on. Ugh. Yeah, so home, food, potentially a nap. And I get to do this whole thing over again tomorrow. Perfect. So cardio in the morning. I'll post my little Instagram story about it to put it right in your face so you know I'm doing it. So I will see you tomorrow for a solid chest pump. There we go. That sound working. We are ready to go. So, typically I wouldn't really do a little car talk because usually I wouldn't drive to this gym. It's only a second away from where I live. But I gotta go on a little bit of an errand after the gym. After this ideally magnificent chest and side belt day. So, not just chest and shoulders. I was talking about this last chest day. I think I've kind of been doing a little bit of a unnecessarily large lift by doing chest and shoulders together. Not that it's like an insane combination, but really, you know, let's think about this. So today, you know, the last couple of days I've been doing chest and shoulders, shoulders being side delts and rear delts. And tomorrow I only do back, just back. So, that means that today, I'm going to go into the gym and do 24 total working sets. Because I'm going to do 8 for chest, 8 for side delts, and then 8 for rear delts. I'm gonna, I used to do 11 for everything. I'm, I'm trying to lower the volume, see how, it, see how it feels. So, I mean, 8's kind of arbitrary, but it's a number where, by the time I've done that many hard sets, 
I feel like I did enough and I got a good pump. So that's kind of how it's, you know, based on. Around there, I think is probably right. Uh, but so getting back to that, 24 sets in one lift and then eight in the other. It's not like there's anything special about doing rear delts and side delts on the same day, apart from just having a big shoulder pump, which is kind of nice. But honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, the back, <laughs> the back pump check would probably be uh, would probably be even freakier with a rear delt pump. Maybe I've been missing out on some extra width at the top end of my lat spreads, <laughs> at least during the posing session. So, but up, apart from any of those sort of benefits, then it's just a little bit more of an even workload. You know, I used to do a split where I would do. Well, I used to do the Arnold split for a while. I still wouldn't do shoulders, because I, I do shoulders kind of sparingly, because they're kind of overdeveloped. But I would do legs, chest and back, and then arms. So leg day, that's pretty good. You know, two pretty solid muscles, but it's legs, you know, that's just how it's, that's just part of the deal. And then arms, two small muscles, so still not that crazy. But chest and back, I just found that it ended up being a little bit too much. Like I'd do chest and chest would be sweet. The chest workout would be perfect because I mean, I did chest first. And then by the time I got to back, it just, I was already kind of fatigued. The pump wasn't really there. And I mean, that's a, uh, that's really your whole torso all at once. So now I split it up. So instead of repeating that split every three days and doing legs, chest and back, arms, and then the next day go right back to legs again and repeat the loop. Now it's got an extra day and legs on their own, then chest side delts, then back and rear delts, and then arms, if you were curious about the current uh, current split. Which honestly, it kind, of, it kind of seems like a silly question for you to ask. Because if you look at the upload schedule, that is the split. You know, it's just a lift after lift after lift. I mean, it, I guess that depends on your pattern recognition skills, but as long as you hit every muscle group about twice a week, I'd say that's pretty much the ballpark you want to do. You know, no point over complicating. It's like if you go hard, you'll get the same results from doing push pull legs or Arnold split. You know, I think people, I think it gets a little weird if you're going full body. I'm not inclined to want to do a full body workout, apart from maybe just for general athleticism and staying active. In a bodybuilding context, you know, I, I want to go in here and just thrash specific muscles on a specific day. But plan for chest. I would love to do incline Smith machine as the opener, but they got rid of a bunch of old equipment and, you know, kind of ticked off about it, you know? Because they had these two old Smith machines, and they didn't have any counterweights, so it was just the bar on the rails, which is perfect. You know, that's my favorite kind. It's super smooth, whatever. And then they also had this really old pec deck. I mean, I, the old machines—they knew what they were doing when they designed them. Right? I feel like a lot of—I guess now I'm just freaking roasting a f gym equipment companies, but. To an extent, I think they're kind of trying to reinvent the wheel. You know, I'm not saying there aren't cool new machines. Like, I try new shit, and I'm like, oh, I've never seen this before. It's badass. But, you know, when you got a pec deck, and the seat is, like, moving up and down as you do the rep, and there's cables upon cables just on pulleys, it's like you don't have to overcomplicate it that much. That's, uh, that's more of just a personal take, though, you know. And sometimes those machines feel good, so it's, it's kind of just, uh piece of equipment to equipment basis on that note on that freaking note so I'm kind of just driving I'm just driving circles before I actually get to the gym because before I got in the car I just slammed the pre I did two scoops of the strawberry kiwi bloodshot and then one scoop yeah yeah I always I mix up the name and then one scoop of the uh, the bubblegum hostility honestly not that bad not that, I mean, you gotta think, these, both of them are like kind of a sweet fruit flavor. It's not like they're com on complete opposite spectrums of taste. Just a little bit, uh, it was just kind of hard to pinpoint exactly which one was, which one was uh, tasting like what, you know. But, 
again, I say this every time, I'm not really into the, like just in general, the flavors, whatever. That's just, that's just for your own enjoyment. I'm really here for this citrulline. What? I just drew a huge blank on pre-workout ingredients. You get the gist. You get what I'm trying to say here. So I'm going to go in there and do my little... So I'll just explain it. I'm not going to actually record it just because it's kind of a long process. But pre-shoulders, no, pre-chest for sh warming up my shoulders, I'll always sit on a, just a cable stack. You know, do some rotator cuff activations, push downs to make sure my elbows are a little bit warm. Do some forearm wrist curls like that to get my forearms warmed up to hold on to whatever weight I'm about to move. Do a little bit of rowing actions just to kind of warm up my uh, my lats, my upper back. You know, if you're a power lifter, I'm sure you love hearing that shit. Getting your scapular retractions, stuff like that. But you know, once my shoulders are all warmed up, we will jump into whatever that first working set is going to be. I have a pretty strong prediction, but depending on how packed the gym is, it may change. So I guess we'll uh, let's just find out in a second. All right. So I'm now back in my civilian attire. I found a sick pair of jeans at Goodwill. I sw something about either I don't I don't understand if it's like a time period thing, but now when you get jeans, and like you find like you get a real baggy pair of jeans, they're huge at the waist, but they taper down so much at the ankles. Like that's not the look I'm going for. You know I kind of like the carpenter pants. So these ones are gonna last me at least a, a while. I hope. Honestly, I don't know, maybe, I'm hoping after the next bulk they'll be too tight, because they've got some, they've definitely got some play in them now. But that was a pretty freaking solid chest day, if I tell you what. I'm definitely starting to feel the deficit on that incline bench, for sure. Three plates, just feeling kind of heavy. One thing that gets me, too, typically when I, uh, when I go into a deficit is my... My forearms will tend to get a little bit more tight than usual. You know, and I don't mean just like, uh, well, I guess really I kind of mean right in here. Like right in this little brachia, brachial radi brachial radialis. Yeah, I, I can, I can't really be bothered to learn all the names of everything apart from the basics. But, you know, right in here, this kind of forearm, like if you do a reverse barbell curl, right, the main mover. Like, right where that kind of ties into my elbow, that'll get a tad bit tender. But, really all I end up having to do is just, you know, do some warm-ups in the area. So, like, before I did any sets of even just one plate trying to warm up for that bench, you know, I was sitting on the dumbbells doing some reverse curls, doing some rotator cuff stuff. I, uh, I, I'm not inclined to believe that, like, you hold a dumbbell. I don't think doing this really does anything for you. Now this motion here, that I can get behind. That definitely gets your rotator cuff working. So uh, yeah, apart from that warm up, and then feeling a little bit of tenderness in my forearm-ish area, that was a good ass chest day. That machine was good too. I'm kind of surprised how much I liked it. Because you know, the last time I did it, I really just did not care for it at all. I think maybe it was just my execution. Because I, well, I don't remember. That, the last time I was there and did chest and did that machine, it, it had to be weeks ago. But something about it today, I really kind of emphasize actually like locking out and really getting an extra squeeze at the top and then coming back down. So, I mean, <laughs> the pump was flawless, so something must have freaking happened. Something must have freaking happened. So let's, uh, let's kind of recount what the volume was made of. I think it was... It's three sets of inclined press, one set of pec flies, three of that machine. Okay, so six sets of pressing, two, one set of flies, and then one set of kind of lighter squeezing pressing with the cables. You know, that sounds about right. I think you're going to be able to do the most damage to your pecs. And by damage, I mean good damage uh, with the heavy pressing. But in terms of like really getting a pump, getting some blood flow into the area, you know, stuff where you're going to get a real good stretch and squeeze, like flies or some cable work, that's good for you too. And I would want to orient those movements more so towards 
at least the second half of the lift ish I wouldn't want to start off with pec flies for one thing they're just too light and this I'd be able to just sit on the stack forever uh, at least in terms of reps I mean me fresh on that cable stack I, I could foresee 50 reps you know I want to you got to load your muscle with what it's capable of in the beginning of the workout I feel like that's a pretty solid way to go about it, especially progressive overload style. You know, that's a, that first set when I'm nice and fresh and strong, that's a pretty good indicator of my strength level. I uh, I really couldn't be, well, I guess it might bother me a little if I'm like extra weak, but at the end of the lift, you know, I wouldn't mind maybe coming back to the incline bench and putting only two plates, even maybe a plate in a 25. And just kind of doing burnout reps. Maybe do like a, uh, I don't know, maybe a super set of like 185 or two plates on incline bench and jumping straight onto pec deck. You know, I think I was talking about it earlier. The super sets and the drop sets, I'm starting to think that it's just kind of extra, extra fluff, you know? Like, sort of the way I think of my training is, or really any, I mean, anybody's training is you should kind of give yourself some constraints to work within and then go as hard as possible within those. So, you know, I don't go in, and I'm not saying this is the best method, but when I go into the gym, it's not like I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to do as many sets as, as many sets as I can. I'm just going to do as many sets as I can until I get a good pump and then I'll, then I'll call it. You know, I limit myself. I do the eight sets and I kind of have a basic outline of the workout, you know, heavy pressing in the beginning, flies towards the end, burnouts, stuff like that. You know, I limit myself to only those eight sets, so I got to make sure that each of those sets, I'm pushing it to the limit, or at least as close as I can muster. If, uh, I couldn't really imagine going in and doing like a workout where I just didn't push myself on the sets, because I feel like I'd just be wasting my time, you know, I'm in there with a purpose. At least during the actual workout you know when i'm done with the lift and i'm you know let's say i bring a shake too i've said this before i could sit in there for an hour and a half you know because i'm not going to go out to the bars at night that's my social hour that's where all my boys are so <laughs> you know maybe i'm the asshole for wanting to talk to them while they're lifting but i probably wouldn't want to do too much talking when i'm lifting but in between sets nothing wrong with a little chatting but if it gets to the point where you're losing your pump, you're uh, you know, you're not maintaining a sweat, right? it's that's a little bit too much. You know, if you're talking for more than five minutes between sets, and even five minutes is probably a bit excessive, then you know what are you doing in there? I'm not prone to like agitation in the gym. Like if everything's busy, you know, I'll just find my own stuff, or I'll like pick a new movement, whatever. You know, it's not like I'm going to think, oh, crap, everybody's on my machines. Fuck, what are you doing on my machine? Like, you know, I'm not really thinking that. But I was kind of starting to lose my mind a little bit on the beginning of the, uh, in my warm-up, because I'm doing cable stuff just to, you know, get my triceps warm, rear delts, some rowing action, you know, shit like that. Fuck, these guys were sitting on the cables just standing there for, like, I was probably waiting for 10-ish minutes, and I saw one dude just standing in front of the cable for 10 minutes. It's like, come on, man, let me use some shit. What are you gonna do? But didn't let that stop me from having a good lift. Not even a little. I hope the audio doesn't get too messed up from the rain. Plan now is to, I don't know, fuck, man, just go back to the crib, eat some food. A little bit of traffic now. Let's just pull up the, the macros and see what we're at. So it's. It's 5.30, I've had 130 grams of protein, 65 grams of fat, I kind of overshot that, 192 grams of carbs. So it looks like I've got mainly protein left, 120 grams worth. I'm sure when I get home, I'll just probably make a big omelet or something like that. You know, I'm not going to want to just drink a protein shake, because that's not going to be filling. You know? My whole deal with food, just in general, if I were to like condense my approach to it, is you know, I care about the macros. Macros are what are going to translate to actual tangible results. If I sit here and eat 5,000 calories of, you know, 
chicken and rice, guess what? I'm still going to get fat. Well, I'm still going to gain weight. And if I sit here and eat 1,500 calories worth of sweets, I'm still going to lose weight. Because you know, it's all about just thermodynamics and how much energy that food has to offer you. you know, I'm not saying that fucking donuts are a one-to-one -one equivalent to rice. But in terms of gaining and losing weight, it's all about the calories. But there is definitely a second level of complexity in that when it comes to how filling this food is. Because if I were to go home, I mean, I could... I could just make a 600 calorie shake, like, you know, four Reese's cups, four uh, scoops of protein, and, uh, you know, maybe some of that cluster dextrin. Blend that up. I mean, I could, that could be like a thousand calorie shake. And it would maybe give, it would maybe make me feel full for like an hour. Right? So I want to eat foods like fucking actual proteins. Like, I've got nothing against protein powder. I love it. But it's not very filling. You know, it's just a way to get protein in in an easy way. So when I'm bulking and I'm eating a ton of food, like tons of carbs and fats, then I'd be more prone to eat protein shakes throughout the day. But now that I'm you know, trying to make sure that everything I eat makes me as full as possible, then I mean, I'll have a protein shake post-workout. That's it. Or maybe if I'm like in a pinch and I can't prep some food. Like, uh, I think I said this earlier, I actually felt kind of like a, a real bodybuilder. Because when I went to class today, I packed a, uh, I packed some steak and then a pack of, uh, you know, Ben's instant rice. It was, uh, it was cheddar broccoli. Honestly, I really should get some, uh, you can get like, I don't know what it is. It's like basically mashed potatoes. Well, it's like imitation mashed potatoes, but it's made with like cauliflower. So it's like a whole little like, bowl, like a couple of the mashed potatoes, quote, quote. But it's only like maybe 10 grams of carbs. You know, something like that paired with the protein, like steaks or chicken. That would be pretty good. Or fish. I've got some cod sitting in the fridge. It's good until like a week from now. So I'll, I'll make sure I cook that. Maybe I'll do that tonight. Maybe I'll freaking do that tonight. Cardio in the morning. I've got a solid 30 minutes planned. Seated bike, as always, you know, I I really just can't relate to you guys when you talk smack on the cardio. And even just, uh, just anybody, the cardio is just a good move. It's an objectively good thing for you to do. So if you were potentially, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you should, even though you should, if you were to potentially implement it into, re into your routine, I think you'd have nothing but benefits. Like, sure, it's got a time cost, but let's say the quickest method possible, you have a little seated bike at the kitchen at home, like I do, which, I mean, Facebook Marketplace, 50 bucks, just a, just a half hour in the morning, right? Oh, but Sam, I don't have a half hour. All right, man, shit. I don't really believe you, but, you know, whatever. Hey, everybody's got a half hour. Come on. And it's probably good for you to wake up early anyway. Of course, I say that, but then, you know, I, I wake up at like 9. It depends on what I have to do that day. So, I'm going to get back home, try not to crash in the rain. I, I need some new fucking tires. My, uh, my tires are getting kind of bald. They've got a little bit of tread left, but, yeah, that's what I got to do this weekend. I got to do fucking tire trip place. And other than that, man, same old, same old, you know, schoolwork. Actually, that's really all I'm dealing with right now, some schoolwork. I, I just implemented my classic study habit of finishing a project the night before it was due. I'm not, I said, this is going to be a flashback to an earlier video. I'm not saying it's the best method, but if you wait until the last minute, that it only takes a minute. And, uh, that is terrible advice. Don't listen to that. <laughs> Alright. I'm going to focus on driving. And uh, I had a good lift. I did my cardio. In an ideal world, all of you guys can say that exact same thing. So, I will see you next time. Alright. So, uh, heading back to more of kind of a 
Eh, yeah, I'd say an intense gym for back. I was kind of torn. I was either going to go just to the YMCA that's a little closer to me, or this gym, which is a little bit further, you know, this metro. But, I mean, really there was no real question. Because the YMCA, they've only got cables, like they have a hammer strength row, like the classic, oh fuck, I'm actually supposed to go left, whoops. Well, that was fucked. Like the classic, um, like the classic seated one with all the four handles and whatever. So, it's not like I couldn't get a good back workout there, but... This Metro has just way more stuff. Like, it, they've got this underhand one I know I'm going to love. Actual pull-downs, so... You know, for the most part, I want to cater whatever gym I go to to... You know, it's, there's a couple of different factors at play. It's like, what equipment do they have? How far is it? You know, it's a little... Just a little back and forth of uh, thought processes like that. But... Basic plan, I'm imagining some... Pull-downs and rows. Maybe even pullovers, you know? It's actually going to be a relatively quick lift. Well, actually, I totally forgot. I got rear delts to do, too. So, rear delts will be at the end. You know, it's kind of a... Yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to start with the main muscle of the lift. But then I kind of do the opposite with legs. I like starting off with hamstrings first. But that's kind of because, you know, for me, I kind of like squatting or doing compressing and leg extensions after I've already had a hamstring pump. Just kind of makes my knees feel a little bit better. But, yeah. Uh, there's really not much else to say about the lift than that. We've I mean, seen every other back day. I've only got eight sets total as my working sets. You know, not including the warm-ups, of course. So, you know, I'll pick a machine and if it feels good, I could foresee sitting on like a row machine for five sets. And then finishing with like three sets of some other kind of pull down. Back is a little bit different for me because, well, just in general. Because with back, you got pull downs, right? You're very lat biased. And you've got rows for your mid back. You know, it's a pretty big muscle. You kind of have to hit it all over. But with something like, you know, biceps or tries, if I do a set of standing dumbbell curls or if I jump onto a push down and I just love the way it feels, and I'm hitting pretty much the whole muscle all at once, then I could just sit there for the whole workout. Love it. But back, I do have to change it up a little bit. So, as I'm sure you'll notice, there's not going to be any deadlifts or even any uh, oh, rack pulls. Yeah, I never see any rack pulls nowadays. Or at least not in the gyms I go to. With deadlifts, I mean, it's the same reason I don't squat when I'm cutting, is it's just a very taxing lift. You're getting your hamstrings into play, you're getting your glutes going, your lower back. Now you're getting some lat activation and traps too, but it's just it's just too much, you know. I'd want to spend that energy doing pull downs or rows where I'm just hitting my back and nothing else. You know, that's kind of <laughs> I feel like that's sort of the whole point of like bodybuilding style training. Like I always find it kind of weird if people are working multiple muscle groups in the same movement. Like is it the Arnold press? No, 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 that's not it. I don't see this too often, but when I do, I notice. Like somebody's sitting on a bench and they do a curl up into a shoulder press. That's very functional, but if you want big biceps or big shoulders, I think you should just hit them each on their own. So, In that same logic, I'm going to use fucking straps. I'm not trying to work anything but my lats or my traps or you know, Terry's major, rhomboids, whatever, you know, everything that's going on back there. So I don't want to be spending energy gripping onto all these handles with my forearms. I want to strap in so I can really just focus on pulling with my, uh, with my scapula, my shoulder blade. You know, get a good squeeze. So if you get a problem like flexing your lats and you're not using straps, I think there's a pretty direct correlation. I got two scoops of the... Since this gym is like 20 minutes away, I, I didn't just drink the pre before the drive. I'll drink it now. But I got two scoops of the Kiwi Strawberry Bloodshot. And then one of the Peach Burst Hostility. One thing I'm going to try for the next month is I'm adding Beta Alanine. Because those two pre's, they don't have Beta Alanine just in them. You gotta have to get it... Well, you don't have to get it on, on your own. 
you can add it if you want. Honestly, I think beta alanine is responsible for kind of being a off-putting product in pre-workout just because it gives you that tingly feeling, you know? But it takes about, like I was looking into this earlier, I was kind of curious. So you get full effects from the beta alanine. Like creatine, you kind of have to load it. So, I mean, me taking it today, I'm not really going to get any anything out of it. Right? You have to load, I think it's about 200 grams over the course of like a month. So five-ish, six-ish grams a day with your pre. After about a month, you'll be fully saturated. And then you'll actually get the, uh, get the performance benefits. So I tried adding it before, but I just didn't like the tingly feeling. It kind of annoyed me. But... I want to see what that's like today. So if I'm scratching at my face and my arms and whatever else during the lift, that's definitely why. But I'll slam this in a minute and then you just cut to whatever the first working set's going to be. All right. So back and rear delts complete, pumped, and in a more pressing matter, I'm fucking starving right now. Let's do a little bit of a macro check. It's 6.30, and I've had 1,300 calories. Well, actually, no. I've had 1,100, and I'm about to have another 200 with this protein bar. So, 7 grams of fat. Not ideal, but what are you going to do? 22 grams of carbs. But that's not the end of the story, because you read one little, uh, uh, you know, one couple of letters over... Fiber, 10 grams. So for the most part, fiber is going to be insoluble, which means, you know, sure, it's like, it's technically still made of carbs, like glucose molecules chained together, but it's called fiber, right? Because it's, it's fibers. You can't break it up. I guess that's not why it's called that, but whatever. You can't digest fiber for energy, you know? So those 10 grams of fiber... Sure, it gets counted in the total grams of carbs. It literally says right there, total carbs. But the fiber doesn't count. So this isn't 22 grams of carbs. It's 12. And then 21 grams of protein. You know, primarily, I mean, I'm looking at the first ingredient. Milk protein isolate, whey protein isolate. Solid source. Now, if this said, like, soy protein or, like, bean protein or something along those lines, you know, a source of protein which I would not really uh, refer to as complete, then maybe I'd be a little bit more reluctant to count the entire value. You know, maybe I'd count it as half or maybe I wouldn't even count it at all. But I know that's kind of weird because, you know, my whole thing is talking about calories in, calories out. So you got to count all your calories like and why wouldn't you count the protein in that slice of bread? I mean, it's just not a complete protein, you know. So, it's... I just don't really feel like it's doing that much. But that's more... That's probably something where I'm a little bit more prone to just have a... A bro science mentality about it. Instead of, like, a legit whatever. But... You know, I've cut down a couple of times, pretty lean, and I've always counted the non-dedicated protein sources as negligible. And guess what? It seems to work when I track everything else, you know, pretty hard. So. I hear this cope a lot. Well, you know, food labels are, they can be up to 20% inaccurate, you know, there's really no point. Like, why would you even track your macros if they're probably 20% inaccurate? So, what are you going to do, man? Whatever. You know, no matter what, you're going to have a bet you're going to have a better chance of getting lean by tracking your macros even if the nutrition label is slightly off than if you just say, "Eh, whatever, you know, I'll just eat." Man. You know, there's pretty much no solid uh, well, there's not a massive probability that you're going to have an awesome, uh, or let's just say progress, productive bulking or cutting phase if you're not at least tracking the amount of food that you're eating. 
on a daily basis. You know, and that doesn't mean that you have to track the macros per se. That's just sort of the method that I go about it as. Like, let's say you're bulking and you just eat the same, like, meals. Like, you don't even mess with the, the macros. You just make sure every meal you get, like, six ounces of chicken and, like, two cups of rice and some olive oil or whatever. You know, and then over time, if your bulking weight starts to plateau, you just add more meals. I mean, that works too. It's just for me. I'm not a huge uh, prepper in that sense. Uh, if I know I'm going to be gone for a substantial period of time, like when I go to class or if I've got like a road trip or something or whatever, I might be more prone to, you know, prep some stuff. But for the most part, I just kind of make the food when I need to eat it. So, if you're gone for like, you know, most of the day, like I've got gaps in between my classes where I can come back to the house, eat some food, and then go back out. So if you're gone for like a solid chunk, like any more than probably five hours, it's going to be in your best interest to make sure you bring some stuff with you. Wow, this is a long ass light. Because, I mean, whether you're bulking or cutting, it's good to kind of have a steady flow of food, in my opinion. That's sort of my methodology with it. Because let's say you're bulking. You're trying to hit, let's hypothetical, you're trying to hit 4,000 calories at the end of the day under the constraints of you have to get at least a gram per pound of protein you know, gram per pound of body weight of protein, and uh, maybe, yeah, that's that's the only, that's the constraint. And then maybe 100, 150 grams of fat, whatever. You're aiming for 4,000 calories. You skip breakfast, and you skip lunch. So now you have to eat 4,000 calories from the time span of like 2 p.m. before you go to bed. You're going to have to eat much bigger meals much more frequently than you would have if you, you know, maybe ate a big breakfast, right? Packed a lunch. You know, spreading it out throughout the day will make it easier for you to eat more food than it will be to just save it all for, you know, before you go to bed. Because then, if you're serious about making sure you hit that number, you know, if you delay it until later, then you're going to end up staying up late to eat your food. Then you're going to cut down on your sleep and you're going to end up sleeping in. And it's just re like a repetitive downhill spiral. So anybody bulking, try to have as big of a breakfast as you can, hit a solid lunch, and you shouldn't have too much problems getting the rest of your meals in throughout the day. Now, in a dieting context, it gets a little more funky. You know, I wouldn't mind being a little bit more sparse with my calories up until lunch. Like, you know, I don't mind skipping breakfast sometimes and just going straight to my fasted cardio and packing a meal for an hour or two hours later. Right? But... I think a lot of, let's just say laymans who aren't really into the whole macro tracking thing, uh, the way that they think about dieting isn't really like eating, you know, food uh, specifically that is going to make them feel full but isn't very calorie dense, you know, like all the keto breads I'm always talking about or, you know, proteins with low sugar sauces and stuff like that. You know, typically when people think about dieting, they only think about eating less food. So then what's going to happen is they're going to eat, like, jack shit all day. You know, go to work, go to school, like, maybe just drink, like, a Sprite Zero or something. And then get home and be like, ah, oh, you know, I don't need anything. I'll, I'll just have a little salad or something. And then, at night, <laughs> I feel like people are prone to get into the thought process of, oh, I was good today. Now I get a treat. One, like, one big little session of you eating enough to where you're hungry... Or no, no, no. One, uh, one like big meal where you're just really going at it at night, so big that you like feel really full. That can completely counteract the whole day of being in a deficit. You know, it's not hard to just slam a bunch of food if you're seriously hungry. So it is a bit trickier to try to you know, slowly maintain a state of fedness like by eating kind of small meals throughout the day. Maybe a little bit of a snack here and there. Calorie smart options. 
But in either case, tracking your macros, having your little stupid simple macro tracker, as well as a food scale in the kitchen, that's just going to make it way freaking easier on you. So, unrelated to that little uh, dieting rant, plan for tomorrow is going to be an arm day. Arms and calves. I, uh, my plan with calves right now is just doing them, you know, whenever they're not sore. So I was feeling them a little bit today. Well, I'll hit them. And it's been a while since I've really had calves in the routine. I've been lazy. But the longer I do them, they do sort of toughen up in a sense. Like, I could get a seriously burning calf pump today. Well, you know, today in the future. And then the next day, they could feel fine. You know, your calves are probably the muscle that gets used the most during just day-to-day -day life, right? So they're used to getting worked. That's the old school bro science logic about it, at least. And those guys seem to have pretty big calves. So at the very least, you know, maybe try like a month of daily calves or calves as frequent as possible. You know, if they're sore, don't do them. But if they're not sore, eight sets at the end of your lift, get a pump, burn them out. You know, then get in the car and chill. So I'd say at least try a month, man, you know. You can't just... Like, you've got to give yourself enough stimulus when you try new things. Like, you've got to do it for long enough and consistently enough to detect a pattern of potential progress. If you do calves every day for a week, you're probably not going to notice anything. And you're going to think to yourself, okay, well, my calves don't grow. They're genetic. Fuck you. Come on, you know. I mean, people have bad calves genetically. I'm not saying that's not, that's not legit. But you know, have you hit calves daily for like two months? Or have you tried like changing up your calf training through multiple different ways of frequencies and like intensities and whatever? If you've done like every calf workout in the book and more, maybe you even made your own and you still got small calves, well then shit, bad luck. But you know, some of this stuff, you gotta tailor make it to your own situation. There's no one workout which is going to be absolutely perfect for everybody. But they've all got different builds and different uh, reactivities to training and whatever. So that's where, you know, you hear all this advice and tips and frequencies and rep schemes and whatever, which tons of information, absolutely tons of information all over this whole freaking website, internet, everything, talking to guys in the gym getting some real person-to-person -person experience like that. You know, there's almost a limitless amount of information. So it can be a little bit overwhelming to try to figure out what's legit and what's bullshit. But that's the responsibility of you, right, to be able to figure out what makes sense, what's going to work, and what isn't. And part of that isn't just, like, data analysis. Like, okay, this guy says this, and he's pretty big. This guy also says this, and he's pretty big. Okay, it must be true. It's not going to be right all the time. You know, you got to take that as inspiration, try some shit for a little while, and see if it works for you. You know, if it works for everybody else, but it doesn't work for you, and assuming you're not like, you don't have some glaring error in your training, then guess what? For you, it just doesn't work. You got to try it some other way. You know. There's no point in doing it by the book if you don't get the results that you want. So, I think that's pretty much my main point. Now, that's not to say don't do it by the book. <laughs> Especially as a beginner, getting training experience, that's the most important thing you can do. Just going to the gym, like, don't even, you don't even have to go get your creatine and aminos and pre-workout and protein powder yet. Just going to the gym for like a month Consistently, even just a couple of days a week, you know, maybe talking to some guys that you know and having them show you workouts. Like, <laughs> just getting to that step, that's putting you ahead of so many other people, right? This, uh, I was just thinking about this a little bit ago. It was kind of annoying me. Every year, be it New Year's, maybe like halfway through the year, or, well, I guess kind of just 
Always. There's posts. It's like, 2023 is halfway over. What have you done? Have you gotten after it yet? There's only 20, there's only three more months left of 2023. Are you gonna make it effective? Like bullshit like that. And the reason that those posts get made constantly as time passes is because the majority of people just don't, they don't do it. You know, it's like a lot of people want it, but not a lot of people want to do it. So just by taking that one little step, you're separating yourself from the herd. And that uh, uh, that cause and effect, or that, um, you know what I'm trying to say, that'll just increase and increase and increase over time if you stick to it. And that doesn't have to relate to lifting, but obviously, you know, 90, 99% of the shit I'm saying is going to be related to lifting. Arm pump tomorrow, plus calves at the end is a little treat. I, uh, I'll actually record it this time. I'm kind of prone to skip the clips on calves and like adductors and you know the cardio and stuff like that, just because it's kind of boring. There's nothing. There's really not too much to see. But you know, I know uh, I don't really post about the calves too often, so may as well get a little uh, get a little bit of technique description. I guess we can do even a pre and post calf pump check. That'll be nice. So I'm going to go home, eat the rest of my 1,200 calories for the day. Ideally in a few small meals instead of just one big one. So I can go to bed feeling full. And I'm done. Another lift under the belt. I'll see you next time.